Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and had him stand on the highest place, the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike a foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan! For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's a story that's been passed around about four Christian guys who found themselves in a time of confession at a retreat together. And the previous few days had bonded these men closely enough that they felt they could let their guards down and become vulnerable about the hidden parts of their lives. So the first man began to open up. My biggest temptation in life is lust. I'm embarrassed to admit it. A second man opened up. "Uh, My struggle is gambling. Nobody else knows this, but I occasionally give in to the temptation to sneak away to casinos in the middle of the night and to spend money that I do not have. The third guy chimed in, my temptation is alcohol. I'm ashamed to say that I often drink way more than I should. Now at this point, the tension in the air was palpable. The deepest, darkest parts of these guys' hearts were being exposed. So finally, it came to the last guy who was invited to open up. Guys, I hate to tell you this, but my greatest temptation is gossip. And I have to confess that I've recorded and posted all of these confessions on social media. Now, there are a few times a cheesy joke to open a sermon makes sense, but perhaps a teaching on temptation is the exception. (laughs) Temptation is a universal tension. It pursues all of us and spares none of us. We are all tempted. It is simply a part of the human condition. One author defines temptation as, quote, the lure or the wooing that we feel internally, often fed by others or by marketing or by the devil himself to say, think, or act in ways that are either morally wrong or that are not healthy or helpful for us. Now, temptation can manifest in all sorts of ways. We all probably resonate with the temptation to do bad things, but we are also tempted to avoid doing good things. Perhaps you felt a leading to share about Jesus with a coworker, or to offer food to a houseless person outside of your local grocery store to help a struggling neighbor in need. But in each instance, there exists a temptation, a resistance to avoid doing the very thing that you sense the Holy Spirit is nudging you to do. The great contemplatives of the Christian faith have used this paradigm of the world, the flesh, and the devil to name the enemies that we're up against in the war for our soul. Catholic tradition has long held to a standard-bearing list, which they've defined as the seven deadly sins. Most of us are probably familiar with this list, right? Lust, gluttony, greed, indifference, anger, envy, and pride. Most of us recognize the dangers of these actions in and of themselves. But what we often fail to realize is that before any action is ever taken, a thought, a desire, a temptation is pondered which is birthed from an initial deceptive idea, be it to indulge, to give in, or to give up. I've shared this from the writer and teacher John Mark Comer before, but here's how he outlines this paradigm. Next, uh, back slide. There we go. The devil, deceptive ideas that are playing to disordered desires that are normalized in a sinful society. 
Now, these lies curate a life built around the seven deadly sins that feed and stroke our egos in ways that elevate our preferences over all others. So my primary identity is no longer in my status as a child of God. Rather, I am a conservative or a liberal. I'm the CEO. I'm the pastor. I'm the stay-at-home mom. I'm my sexual orientation. I'm the wife. I'm the husband. I'm the single person. I'm the influencer. I'm you fill in the blank. Comer writes this about ideology. He says, quote, ideology is a secular attempt to find a metaphysical meaning to life a way to usher in utopia without God. The best definition I know of ideology is when you take a part of the truth and make it the whole. In doing so, you import your own mind and heart in lies that drive you to anger and anxiety. It promises freedom but produces the opposite. It does not expand and liberate the soul but shrinks and enslaves it. And we see this play out every day in our lives and in the lives of others, right? Some ideologies are less severe. Most people would say the fountain drink, Coca-Cola, is objectively good. Now, depending on what you mean by good, there's truth in that. But when someone says Coke is the only good drink for me and becomes a daily drink of choice, when a partial truth becomes a whole truth, that ideology often feeds a whole host of health issues as one becomes addicted and dependent on certain chemicals and ingredients contained in Coca-Cola. But other ideologies carry far more severity. Take, for instance, the ideology of power embraced by many pastors in recent years. Men and women who have become ensnared by the deceptive idea that positional authority means certain standards are required of others, but not of ourselves. This deceptive idea feeds a desire for importance, for respect, for satisfaction, for acceptance, which is then normalized by a culture that is often embraced solely the number of butts and seats, dollars on the bottom line, and buildings accrued as evidence of ecclesial success or worse, health. I found myself in a conversation recently with a pastor who was recounting how he had found himself in a full-blown affair. Little by little, he said, See, this pastor had convinced himself that the outward success that he was experiencing was equitable to an inward maturation of his spiritual life. Now, these are not always mutually exclusive. Jesus talks often about how good trees bear good fruit, but in many cases, we find that the enemy can use what we deem success as the bedrock for sin to fester in our lives. And as the ideology of power began to be embraced, this pastor started to convince himself that the teachings of Jesus were more accessory than necessary. So what began as a flirtatious text became a relational fixation. What began as a brief touch became a full-on embrace. What began as towing the line became a far-crossing of it. And before he knew it, this pastor had lost his marriage, his ministry, and for some in his congregation, their faith. A deceptive idea of power feeding a larger and larger ego, which was normalized and even celebrated by a culture that cheers for bigger, better, faster, always. Now, I'm picking on pastors here because, in all honesty, at my worst, I see myself in this story. And if I pretend like temptation doesn't exist, then deception is already beginning to gain ground in my life. But understand, in any sector, in any stage of life, temptation is experienced by us all. We are tempted to overconsume, to gossip, to not care, to be affirmed, to have what is not ours, to rage, to be self-centered. The question is not if we will be tempted, but how we will respond when we are tempted. So today, we're continuing in this series of teachings entitled, Teach Us to Pray, where we've been dissecting this prayer of Jesus that he offers to us in Matthew chapter 6. So here it is, beginning in verse 9. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. See, many of us pray, 
The question is, how is prayer shaping and forming who we are becoming? So over the last few weeks, we've broken down this prayer into four parts. Part one, adoration, where we looked specifically at who we are praying to. Part two was submission and supplication, or what we termed dependence, where we looked at what we are praying for. Part three was reconciliation, where we looked at why prayer is the key to healing and wholeness. And today, we'll close out this prayer with part four, righteousness, looking at how prayer shapes and forms us into a particular kind of person. And then next week, we'll close out this teaching series with an auxiliary teaching on unanswered prayer. So that's the journey we've embarked on. If you've missed any of the last few weeks, we'd highly encourage you to go back and listen or watch on Apple Podcasts or YouTube as these teachings are an extension of one another. So let's continue today with part four, righteousness. Temptation has been hardwired into our story since almost the beginning of time. A few weeks ago, I shared how in Genesis chapter 3, we are introduced to the first deceptive idea ever spoken, the very first lie. And I talked about how where Adam and Eve chose their will over God's will, Jesus prayed, yet not my will be done, but Father, your will be done. Undoing the forsaken choice that Adam and Eve originally made. But today, I want to look at this same story from a different viewpoint, through the lens of temptation. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Genesis chapter 3, here we go, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you to not eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Do you see it? A deceptive idea, did God really say, which leads to a disordered desire. Eve saw the tree was good for food and also desirable for gaining wisdom, temptation, which gives way to sin. The very thought of temptation can feel overwhelming and intimidating. I mean, how in the world are we supposed to stand up to something that's so pervasive and constant in our lives? And the truth is, on our own, we can't. Which is why even in a democratic free society where the nature of progress is often propped up as a savior in and of itself, we still have so much societal and systemic brokenness. But the beauty of pledging our allegiance to Jesus as Lord and Savior is that we are now following a leader who himself experienced temptation and who offers to us a vision for how to combat the world, the flesh, and the devil. So we come to our teaching text that Ryan read, Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, how fascinating is this? Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. So, does God tempt us? Well, no. The scriptures are clear. Here's the Apostle James. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So notice that Jesus is not being led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by God the Father, but to be tempted by who? The devil who Jesus calls the father of lies. Interesting, right? 
Like the gospel writer Matthew knows what he's doing here. This is literary genius. But this still begs the question, why would a good, loving God lead anyone to a place where the devil could tempt them? Like, how is that helpful? Well, it's important to note, as we've already mentioned, temptation is universal. You, me, all of us will be tempted. Today, tomorrow, and every day on into the future, we will face temptation. It is simply hardwired into the human condition. But temptation, in and of itself, is not sin. Here's the writer of Hebrews. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. See, temptation actually provides the backdrop for free will, for human agency, and for true love to coexist. The whole reason that Eve is tempted in the first place is because we worship a God who is not some cosmic control freak seeking to pull the strings of our lives. For love to be real, it cannot be coerced. Therefore, we are given opportunities to choose. So look at how James finishes his teaching on temptation. Verse 14, But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So the spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil is setting the scene for Jesus to exemplify how one can filter through deceptive ideas, how one can reorder the desires that come from those deceptive ideas or temptation, and to overcome and defeat sin and death once and for all. That's what's being modeled to us here. So Matthew continues, verse 2. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to Jesus and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Fascinating. This has major echoes of Genesis 3, yeah? Did God really say, If you are the Son of God? Like, what is this? In both instances, the tempter is offering up a deceptive idea. Go ahead, test God out. Go ahead, rethink this one. Go ahead, doubt what you know to be true. See, in context, Jesus has just come from his baptism where God the Father declared, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And now Satan is going directly after that identity. So, you're the son of God? Yeah? Prove it. In other words, take matters into your own hands. Seize life on your own terms. Do it your own way. This temptation has been historically named the lust of the flesh because it's an invitation for Jesus to indulge the desire, this deceptive idea that God cannot and will not provide. I must make it on my own. I must do it my own way. This is Satan tempting Jesus into control, exchanging God's will for his own will. This sort of thinking has gotten me into trouble on so many occasions. Uh, Riley has often commented how I can become fixated or tracked on particular things and how when I'm stressed, I seize control. And I can tell you story after story where over the years, a simple Facebook marketplace browse has turned into a wild goose chase for the perfect monitor or the perfect car radio or the perfect pair of shoes. And it had to be on my time and it had to be done my way. Now, this has become far less frequent in recent years, but I'm aware of how I can often get tunnel vision. And before I know it, half a day has passed as I've sought to control a particular situation. This deceptive idea is laid before Jesus, attempting to play to a disordered desire which will cause Jesus to sin. But look at how Jesus responds. Verse 4, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, this was a quote from Deuteronomy 8.3, which says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, the context of this verse is key. 
Originally, this was Moses explaining to the Israelites how they had survived through their wilderness season. In other words, while they were in the desert, they were kept alive, not merely through manna or bread, but by the very word of the Lord himself. In other words, provision is traced not to material things. These are simply means to an end. And the end is God the Father himself, who provides all that we need. This truth is echoed by Jesus just a few chapters later, which we also covered further a few weeks ago. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Or here's Paul to the Philippians, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So Jesus, who has not eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, is hungry. He's vulnerable. And it would have been so easy to seize control over his situation and to take command. And yet, in the moment of truth, Jesus chose to lean into God, Jehovah Jireh, his provider, rather than to forsake him. So Matthew continues, verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So here we go again, right? Round two. Okay, Jesus, if you are the Son of God... He's attacking Jesus' identity again. How often have you felt the temptation to believe, I don't have what it takes. I'm not enough. I'm not sure. I think God made a mistake. See, one of Satan's most popular tactics is going after who we are by divorcing us from whose we are. The scriptures are clear, my friends. We are conquerors. We are chosen, we are valued, we are loved, we are redeemed, cared for, disciplined, and able to endure. Paul writes this in Romans, that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you. So every time temptation comes our way, it can be seen as an invitation to further cement who we are by remembering whose we are. So, Satan says, throw yourself off the temple. Prove to us that you really are who God says you are. Now, this is what's been historically referred to as the pride of life. Satan's attempting to appeal to Jesus' desire for approval and praise. And notice, he ups the ante here. In this situation, Satan himself now quotes Scripture. He takes a verse from Psalm 91, uses it wildly out of context, and attempts to use God's own word as leverage for Jesus to sidestep the cross and to shortcut his way into glory. The writer of Hebrews notes, the word of God is active and alive, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The problem is, when this sword is wielded improperly, it does immense damage and causes great pain to those it touches. Notice that it is a double-edged sword. It is intended to serve primarily as a scalpel of our own hearts. But often, the word of God is outwardly weaponized to fend off those who we deem untouchable, and this misstep has done tremendous damage to the church's overall witness. My friends, we cannot use the Bible to fit our own narrative. Instead, we must find ourselves in the story. The famous preacher Charles Spurgeon, commenting on this passage, said, quote, Satan borrowed our Lord's weapon and said, It is written. But he did not use the sword lawfully. It was not in the nature of the false fiend to quote correctly. He left out the necessary words. In all thy ways... Thus, he made the promise say what, in truth, it never suggested. Jesus was able to rightly note how Satan was falsely quoting, wrongly applying, and outright misusing the scriptures for his own advantage. 
And in our modern moment, we must be able to do the same. We must avoid twisting scripture into cliches, political slogans, or religious jargon. Paul exhorts Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, my friends, know God's word. Study it. Discern how it should be applied. There are those who are using God's word to fulfill an agenda that is not God's. And Jesus knows this. So he brilliantly replies, once again, with scripture, used correctly. Verse 7, Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So Satan comes back again. Verse 8, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. This has been historically called the lust of the eyes. Satan takes one last swing at Jesus in the desert by casting this grand vision for all that Jesus can have if he just bows down and worships him. Once again, Satan is inserting a deceptive idea to play to a disordered desire. Jesus wants to save the world and thus to rule it. But instead of having to endure an excruciating death on a cross, all he has to do is bow down and worship Satan. Then the kingdoms of the world are his. But notice, they're what kingdoms? They're the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus is solely concerned with ushering in the kingdom of who? The kingdom of God. A deceptive idea, playing to a disordered desire, attempting to bring about sin. Notice, at this point, Satan has done away completely with the Son of God language. He's putting all of his chips on the table. Bow down. Worship me. I'll give you everything you could ever want. And we often tragically see this lived out in the lives of people who, in one way or another, surrender their lives fully to the idol of their choice. It's the woman who has sacrificed everything to make as much money as possible and has staked her entire existence on being a woman of wealth. It's the man who's fully surrendered to the drug of his choice and has willingly exchanged his career, his family, his community, his home, maybe even food on the table for the next hit. See, the kingdoms of this world t- t- tend to promise us everything and leave us with nothing. So again, Jesus' response, verse 10, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Our allegiance is to King Jesus. And under the authority of his rule and reign, we live with an awareness that our primary goal is to partner with Jesus in the forming and fashioning of Indianapolis as it is in heaven. We are not ruled by the powers of this world, but by the power of the kingdom of God. And out of that reality, the true reality, we live in anticipation of the new heaven and new earth to come. The great spiritual writer Henry Nouwen comments on this scene and he describes Satan's invitation as, quote, the three temptations of the soul. And he defines them as this, to be relevant, to be spectacular, and to be powerful. I mean, think about it. If Jesus turned stones into bread, that would be power in its greatest form. If he'd worshiped Satan, he would have been given all authority on earth, becoming the most popular being on the planet. And if he'd thrown himself off of the highest point of the temple and lived to tell the tale, that would have been spectacular. But he abstains because he knows who he is. He remembers whose he is. This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Jesus obeys God the Father's commands over Satan's commands. Does this feel familiar at all, my friends? It should, because this is the Genesis narrative revisited. The serpent tempts Eve and says, eat this and you will become like God. You will be spectacular. You will be relevant. You will be powerful. And Adam and Eve take the bait. But not Jesus. Instead, in Jesus, we find God becoming like us. 
And where Adam and Eve fail, Jesus succeeds. Where Adam and Eve lose, Jesus wins. Where Adam and Eve fall, Jesus triumphs. The new Adam is here. The new Genesis has begun. The kingdom of God is at hand. So Jesus teaches us to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So with our remaining time, I want to ask, how do we defeat temptation? How can we be delivered from evil? Well, hopefully the first way is obvious by now. It comes straight from Jesus, and that is Scripture. Deceptive ideas are destroyed by the truth. Well, what is truth, you may ask? Truth is reality. To say that this preaching stand is real is a true statement. It's here, right in front of me. And notice that Jesus declares that he himself is the truth. He is reality incarnate. Here's Jesus in John 14. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This series of teachings has been looking under the hood at the Lord's Prayer addressed to whom? Our Father. And the way to the Father is how? Through Jesus. Truth himself. So when temptation arises, we look to Jesus as the answer. And how does Jesus respond to deceptive ideas? By quoting the truth. By quoting the scriptures. This is so beautiful, my friends, because at any point, Jesus could have bypassed Satan's temptations and used his power to achieve or attain whatever he could possibly have imagined. He also could have expelled Satan from his presence, cast him away, rebuffed, or ignored him entirely with silence. But he doesn't. Instead, he offers to us, as imago Dei, humans made in the image of God, a way out. There's no trickery, there's no magic, there's no insider code language, and there's no miraculous deliverance out of temptation. According to Jesus, we fight temptation with God's word. Catch this, Jesus is implying that we have everything we need when temptation comes our way to overcome it. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? I'd call that good news, yeah? So my friend, what if you already possess what you most desperately need? Notice, Jesus did not respond to temptation with, hmm, let me think of a crazy one-liner to come back with. Or, I bet there's a mantra out there from an influencer for this. Or, I wonder if there's any song lyrics that resonate with how I'm feeling in this moment. No! How does he respond? It is written. In Ephesians 6, Paul lays out for us what is famously known as the armor of God. And so he talks about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with peace, a shield of faith, a helmet of salvation. Do you notice a theme? This is all defensive armor. And we need it. He says to put this on so that you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. There is absolutely a need in our pursuit of righteousness to be prudent, to be wise, and to be protective. Protective of what we intake, what thoughts we think, what words we say. But Paul finishes this passage with one more piece of armor. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Paul's saying, look, be wise, be on guard, but don't be afraid. Don't be scared when temptation comes. Run it out of the building with God's word. Go on the offensive. Pierce the devil's lies with God's truth. Tell him whose you are. Tell him to whom you belong. Jesus is exemplifying for us the way forward. When temptation comes, there's no need to try to outsmart it, outwit it, or overpower it. Just rebuke it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Preach the word at the devil. God cannot resist coming to his people's rescue. He loves to come to our aid. He loves to remind us and to show Satan who's in control. And his word is the beacon of light that signals, God, we want you here. Look here, verse 11. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. So this week, when temptation comes your way, because it will come your way, Draw your sword. Take the word of God and declare it in dark spaces. In moments of doubt, arousal, confusion, frustration, fear, unleash the word of God. And watch the devil flee in the presence of God and all of his glory come to the rescue. 
Here's Paul in 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. He writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture. My friends, from the first to the last page. Now, this is where most of us would push back. Well, Micah, isn't there some stuff in there, like especially in the Old Testament, that doesn't matter? No. Uh, There are some things that do not or cannot apply to our cultural moments. There are certainly some things that are shared as evidence of practices to avoid, but everything matters. Within these pages is the story of the human condition. The Bible tells us about God, about ourselves, about the world, and about God's plan for us in the world. Notice all of Jesus' responses to Satan are quotes from where? The Old Testament. Jesus himself said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus is clear. The scriptures in their totality are our guide. The final way we can fight temptation is community. Community. Up to this point, we've been looking at these elements of temptation, sin, and evil on personal grounds. But notice Jesus' intentional word choice here as it is throughout this prayer. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. At its essence, this prayer for righteousness is communal. There's a collective desire to not be led into temptation. Oh, how desperately we need to recover this kind of prayer, my friends. The church of Jesus Christ, when the world thinks of it, what do they think? Do they think the fruit of the Spirit? Do they think love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control? No. They think scandal. They think judgmental. They think hypocritical because a watching world is witnessing a church that preaches love from within a particular way of life who is not living it. And we are all the worse for it. We must recover an urgency for communal repentance. And this is modeled for us all throughout the scriptures. So when you pray, what percentage of your prayer is concentrated on others? Because the essence of the Lord's prayer is entirely communal. Our Father, give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. Where is your focus? Are you actively praying for communal deliverance? What if the strongholds that are binding and holding our brothers and sisters down, that are robbing them of joy, what if they could be released through your prayer for us? James says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Within this prayer, Jesus seems to be pointing at a collective duty that we all have to pursue righteousness together through prayer. When we pray this prayer daily at midday as a church, we are effectively linking arms and standing together against the powers and principalities of this world, declaring Satan in the wise words of a gray old man, you shall not pass. Now, for those who got that reference, that book, Lord of the Rings, by the way, was written by Tolkien, who possessed a profound spirituality and understanding of God himself. So we pray for our community, but we also pray in community. The book of Proverbs contains a whole host of wisdom sayings regarding our need for counsel. Here's a few examples. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Where there is no guidance, people fall, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. See, there is power and wisdom in relying on others in prayer. So to aid us in our practice throughout this teaching series, we've printed what we call our Lord's Prayer cards. And they're these tiny credit card-sized cards that can fit in a wallet, on a purse, on a desk, a vanity, fridge, car dashboard. 
And we'd encourage you, grab one or a few and put them where you'll see them throughout the day. And then just once a day, preferably at midday, with all of us or with your circle, wherever you can, our invitation to you is to simply pray the Lord's Prayer. And this week, to focus specifically on this line, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This week, we also printed some Sanctuary Kids Lord's Prayer cards. And on the back, there's a little liturgy for our Sanctuary Kids for you parents. They're all being passed out in kids this week and next week, but they'll also be at the Info Hub if you'd like to pick uh, some up there for your family as well. We also have a recommended reading bookmark with a bunch of amazing books on prayer if you're interested. You can pick this up for free at the Info Hub. And finally, in partnership with our friends at our organization, Practicing the Way, our team has crafted a beautiful prayer guide that can be used throughout this teaching series. And if you'd like to access that, simply go to sanctuaryindy.com slash resources. For those of us who may be newer to practicing prayer, praying with others may be a great place to start in learning how to pray. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, placing ourselves in a communal context often offers the necessary accountability that enhances our resistance of temptation. It's a lot easier to avoid that glass before bed when you've confessed your dependency on alcohol to others. It's harder to get away with talking to your spouse in that tone when you've let others in on your temptation to rage. It's more difficult to look at pornography when you know that you're going to be asked about it the next morning. Most people do not wake up one day and simply decide to wreck their life. Often, it is a slow, gradual drift. Little by little. Remember? In his book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis imagines life through the lens of a demon named Screwtape. And in one of his letters, Screwtape writes, quote, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Community is an antidote to this slow, gradual drift. As we live into this prayer for deliverance from evil within community in pursuit of collective righteousness, we gradually begin to build a personal life of holiness. We partner with God in forming and fashioning of the new heaven and earth to come, a return to our Eden-like state where we are naked and unashamed with nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide. This is the collective pursuit of righteousness, my friends. In the 2016 Disney adaptation of The Jungle Book, there's a scene where Mowgli, the protagonist, comes face to face with Ka, a python, a snake, whose method for killing is hypnosis. And as she converses with Mowgli, she uses her mesmerizing eyes and soothing voice to distract Mowgli from the very fact that she is encircling him in an effort to constrict and then devour him. Before Baloo the bear rescues Mowgli from the snake's clutches. My friends, there is a snake seeking to devour all of us, to lead us into temptation and to deliver us to evil. The apostle Peter writes, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But we serve a God who is willing and able to rescue us, to lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. Here's Paul again in 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. My friends, the need of the hour is for us to be wise and awake, to not fall for the seductive but deceptive ideas of this world which are playing to our disordered desires that are being normalized in a sinful society under the reign of a satanic snake. Instead, we are offered a better way, a way out, a way that brings righteousness, goodness, and peace. In a world filled with lies, truth is available. In a culture enslaved to desire, deliverance awaits. In a society marked by anxiety, peace can be found on a cross, in a tomb, on a throne. The story of stories is here, authored by the creator himself. Deliverance comes when we place our hope and trust in Jesus, when we read, listen to, obey, and understand his word. And when we live communally with other saints, men and women alike, thirsting for righteousness in a dry and weary world. A day is coming where all temptation will cease. 
where all evil will dissipate. But until that day, we hunger and thirst, trusting and believing that our Father will fill us with all that we need to partner with him in preparing us in the world for heaven to invade and for God to rule once 